Um, good afternoon um, and welcome to this lecture. I think the size of the audience uh, is a sign of how anticipated, uh, how we anticipate listening to Professor Ferguson. I am Jack Citrin, the director of the Institute of Governmental Studies, and I am truly delighted to welcome Neil Ferguson to deliver the second R. Kirk Underhill Lecture. This lecture is the signature event of the Anglo-American Studies Program, which was established at the Institute of Governmental Studies to, pro to promote scholarship and commentary on the enduring yet changing relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States. Before introducing Professor Ferguson, I'd like to say a few words about Kirk Underhill and this Anglo-American Studies Program. Robert Kirk Underhill graduated from Cal in 1928 with a degree in economics. A lifelong Anglophile, he founded the Robert Kirk Clothing Store in San Francisco, the specializing in the import and sale of British goods. And with his success, he founded the Anglo-California Foundation and also was a generous funder of British studies, both at Cal, uh, here on campus, and at Stanford. After his death, thanks largely to Brad Barber and Charles Stevenson, trustees of the foundation and confirmed Anglophiles themselves, uh, IGS received a generous bequest to establish this program at Berkeley. Uh, Brad Barber is here sitting in the front row and his vision and support continues to help the program thrive and I want to thank him I also want to recognize, also sitting in the front here, my colleague, Professor Terry Bimes, for planning not just this lecture, but the ongoing series of conferences and book talks about Anglo-American relations. I'd also like to thank history professor Daniel Sargent, also sitting in front. He worked with Professor Ferguson when he was a doctoral student at Harvard, and I know their friendship was instrumental in bringing Neil to campus, so thank you, Daniel. Finally, the co-sponsors of this event should be thanked, the Center for British Studies, the Institute of European Studies, the Institute of International Studies, and the Center for Right-Wing Studies. So now to turn to our speaker. Neil Ferguson is really the ideal person to give this lecture. He was born in Scotland, received his MA and DPhil at Oxford, and then has spent great portion of his professional life in the United States, holding tenured positions at New York University and at Harvard. He now has moved to the West Coast and is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. So welcome to the Bay Area. Um, but more than having lived, studied, and taught in both the United States and the United Kingdom, he has given deep and sustained thought to events in both these countries and particularly to the development and perhaps decline of these two empires. In, em in his book, Empire, the Rise and Demise of the British World Order and the Lessons for Global Power, and then Colossus, the Rise and Fall of the American Empire, he explores how both of these nations must cope with the reality that they no longer are the global superpowers they once were. To review professors Professor Ferguson's prodigious scholarship and commentary would leave no time for him to speak. So you should follow up the brief bio on the program by going to Google and you will learn a lot more. <laughs> he has published 14 books on a wide range of topics. He's received numerous prestigious awards for these books and several of them have been made into prize winning television series which doubtless many of us have seen. I do want to mention his latest book which is the first volume uh, of an authorized biography of Henry Kissinger. This volume one, which is extremely thick, is called Kissinger, 1923 to 1968, The Idealist. It is really superb and is receiving deservedly favorable reviews. And he will be working on the second volume of Kissinger's biography this year. So I suspect we'll learn today not only about Brexit, and about its implication, and, and, but also a lot about its implications for the United States. On a Berkeley note, we on the Berkeley faculty often contemplate and sometimes yearn for 
our own exit from the University of California system <laughs> and the office of the president. So maybe, and then going it on our own. So maybe there are some local lessons as well we will learn. After his lecture, Professor Ferguson will take questions from the floor, and then we invite you to a reception in the atrium. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn things over to our speaker, Neil Ferguson. Well, thank you very much. Yes. You took the words out of my mouth. Um, I'm trying to think what disturbing devices those might be. I rather regret um, not having known until this morning that Bob Dylan was going to win a Nobel Prize. Uh, I'm sure uh, this must be one of those campuses where Dylan is still revered. And uh, it would have given me a much better title for my talk this afternoon, uh, namely, namely Tangled Up in red, white, and blue. Uh, that's really the story that I, I want to tell. And uh, I'm going to focus on explaining as best I can what happened in uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, to give it its full title, this year. Uh, and I will leave you to draw some inferences uh, from my analysis for the United States in this uh, extraordinary Annus Mirabilis, or is it Annus Horribilis, uh, that is 2016. Uh, full disclosure, I was uh, actively engaged in the campaign against Brexit. I was a Remainer. I was uh, involved with the campaign to the extent of advising then Prime Minister David Cameron on at least one of the speeches that he gave. I wrote numerous articles on the subject in the Sunday Times uh, in London and elsewhere. And so I can't present my thoughts as the unbiased, dispassionate observations of a scholar of of British history, uh, that would be a lie. So everything that I have to say needs to be uh, in some measure discounted because not only did I take a side, but I took the losing side. And there's something about defeat that leaves you scarred. I hate losing. The uh, night of the 23rd, 24th of June was an ex exceptionally unpleasant night uh, for me and an even more unpleasant one for David Cameron. So what I'm going to say is, as far as I can achieve it, a dispassionate, but you should know which side I was on. And I still uh, take the view that... Uh, Britain has made a major mistake, the full magnitude of which has not yet uh, become clear. From a historian's point of view, this was a world historical event. Uh, it recalled to mind uh, some of the great schisms in modern British political history. The schism over the Corn Laws uh, that toppled Sir Robert Peel from power. It brought to mind Munich, 1938. It recalled the Suez Crisis of 1956. I said at the time to my old friend Andrew Roberts, an historian who took the other side, who was an ardent Brexiteer, that this might well leave the kind of enduring uh, scars that those previous uh, schisms in the Conservative Party had left. He and I had been on the same side for much of the 1990s, arguing against 
British membership of the uh, single currency. Indeed, Andrew wrote a novel, uh, The Aachen Memorandum, uh, which, amongst other things, accurately predicted the result of the referendum of 2016. And in that, uh, he and I were members of an anti-European resistance uh, that sprang up after uh, a certain period of, uh, of, uh, of European integration had taken place. So not many people, I think, expected me to be on the side of Remain. My track record seemed to be that of a Eurosceptic. Uh, but I want to try and explain to you uh, that there was a profound difference between opposing the creation of a single currency, opposing other measures that were uh, debated in the 1990s and early 2000s, such as the removal of all barriers on migration within uh, the EU, the removal of even uh, visa and passport checks under the Schengen Agreement, and opposing exit from the European Union altogether. To me, there was a profound difference, and there still is, between resisting steps in the direction of uh, federalism that seemed bound to fail and uh, opposing uh, the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the EU. There was a difference, however, between the repeal of the Corn Laws, Munich, Suez and Brexit. And that difference is captured nicely by this uh, photograph of my Oxford near contemporary Boris Johnson. <laughs> the root of uh, the Brexit campaign, I want to argue, was a profound frivolity, uh, uh, indeed a responsibility, that made it extremely hard for a serious debate to take place. When politics becomes simply a uh, a brand or, or subset of entertainment, then rational dialogue is at a discount. This is the first of a number of analogies with the United States that I don't need to make <laughs> explicit. For historians, the challenge is always to remember that the past was not so determinate when it was the future. Up until about three in the morning on June the 24th, the probability was that Britain would remain in the European Union. On June the 10th, uh, just two weeks before uh, that result, the betting markets, this is from the Betfair website, had uh, remain on 73% and Brexit on 27%. And that was by no means uh, an outlying prediction. Some of the leading sophologists, specialists in British uh, electoral behaviour, gave roughly similar odds at this time. And indeed, the opinion polls continued to show remain ahead, albeit by narrowing margins, right up until the day of the vote. And I think part of our problem was that it was just so easy to mock the Brexit campaign. Or perhaps I should put it differently. It was so hard to take it seriously. How could one take Boris Johnson seriously when his own position had been so open that on the day before he announced his decision to back Brexit, he wrote two separate op-eds for his regular Telegraph column, one arguing for Remain and one arguing against it. Uh, this seemed like such naked opportunism that it was hard to believe the wider public would be fooled. The problem was, and this problem persists, that we who follow closely opinion polls or, for that matter, financial markets, hadn't noticed the peculiarity of, of 2016. 2016 is the year of the improbable. It was uh, surely improbable that Leicester City would win the Premiership. Some of you, I, I'm sure, are Anglophile enough to follow soccer. Um, I wore my Arsenal cufflinks, especially 
for this occasion. Uh, and if there's any crowd trouble uh, from Liverpool fans or Manchester United fans, remember, we pay your benefits. That is an actual song that they sing at the Emirates Stadium. The, the, the year of the improbable produced uh, a Leicester City victory in the Premier League that nobody had predicted. Iceland did better than England in the European Soccer Championships. And of course, Donald Trump became the uh, Republican Party nominee for the presidency. And in January of this year, Nate Silver, that guru of American elections, attached a 12% probability to Donald Trump becoming the nominee. This was and has been, and may I hope it doesn't, but it may continue to be the year of the improbable. Actually, we should have known a little bit better. The, the polling, uh, and you can see here what had happened in the run-up to June 10th, had shown that it was pretty close. Um, and indeed, confusion reigned because the results of telephone polls and online polls were simply dif difficult to reconcile. Actually, if you looked at the raw polling numbers, which you can see in this slide here, and you just have all the different individual polls plotted as blue dots, uh, it was extremely hard to be confident about, indeed it would have been wildly foolish to be confident about the result. On the day uh, of the vote, I had come to the conclusion it was 50-50. My probabilities had gone from 0% a, a year before, when I was asked in the summer of 2015 about Brexit, I said, this is not going to happen. You should never attach 0% or 100% to any <laughs> political scenario as uh, probability. By January, I thought 35% probability of Brexit. Uh, it was 40% in my view by the end of May. And on the day, I realised it was 50-50. It was Interestingly, George Osborne, the Chancellor then, uh, who really had been the mastermind of the election victory of 2015, uh, told me uh, over the summer he knew that Brexit had won the week before the vote uh, on the basis of his uh, sense of the mood in the country. And you did have to travel around uh, the country to get a sense of how close it was. If you just stayed in London, you were bound to get the wrong idea, for reasons I'll come back to. It was to the provinces you had to travel uh, to get a sense of what was happening. Here's the result. And for those of you who um, know this intimately, forgive me, but for those of you who perhaps only know who won, this may be of real interest. Uh, broken down uh, by uh, region, it's a very striking result indeed. Not least because my country, Scotland, voted by uh, very close to two-thirds to remain. That was a profoundly different result from the one uh, in England and also in Wales. Uh, so when you look at these uh, results, the first thing that leaps out is the real difference between Scotland and, and England and Wales. Uh, no, notice the division in the Northern Ireland results. The closer you are to the, uh, the Republic border, the more likely you are uh, to favour leave, um, to favour remain, excuse me. So what happened was that provincial England and Wales, but not London, not Scotland, uh, voted uh, to leave. And this, of course, can be explained in terms of the increasing polarisation between Scotland and England that there has been really since the 1980s in uh, political terms. Uh, that polarisation had not been sufficient to lead Scotland to vote for independence in 2014. Uh, another referendum in which I played a part, albeit a minor one, another uh, uh, referendum uh, but one that I was on the winning side uh, of because I opposed uh, Scotland's leaving the UK as vehemently as I, p I opposed Britain's leaving the EU. I'm happy to take questions on why, uh, if it's of interest. But what's really striking to me is not so much Scottish attitudes as English ones. 
If you look at uh, Remain voters, and here I'll just draw your attention to these figures, something very striking appears. 79% of uh, Leave voters uh, define themselves as English, not British. And that's important, uh, or, and 66% as more English than British. That's important because I think, as my old friend Roger Scruton pointed out in a really thoughtful essay in Prospect magazine, Brexit uh, is a misnomer because it's about the English, not the British. I always have to explain this to American audiences. Uh, forgive me if it's uh, something you already know, but uh, we're all British. In fact, the idea of calling it Great Britain was the idea of a Scotsman, uh, James VI of Scotland, who inherited the English throne when Elizabeth I died. Aware that the English might resent being ruled by a Scotsman, he suggested that the merged kingdom be referred to as Great Britain, since Britain was one of those words that both English and, uh, and Scots could relate to. Uh, so I'm British, as well as Scottish. I'm not English! There's a great moment in one of those World War II prisoner of war films that you've all probably seen. It's, it's, it's a British uh, black and white POW film. And Stanley Baxter, the great Scottish comedian, uh, played a, a, a prisoner of the, the Germans. And there's a wonderful moment which sums it all up for me when the German uh, guard shouts at, at Baxter, Silence, English pig! Scottish pig. <laughs> but Scotland's a small country, population less than five million and probably dwindling. It can't really be said that it was Scotland that decided the outcome. At least I think that would be misleading. Um, in fact, Scotland failed to decide the outcome. That's the real point. It didn't matter that Scotland wanted to stay. In the end the Scots were outvoted comprehensively. The more important explanation for Brexit has to do with differentials in turnout by age. Now, a lot of erroneous data uh, did the rounds in the immediate aftermath of the vote, uh, to the effect that uh, only 36% of people aged between 18 and 24 had voted. That was quite, quite wrong. Um, more recent research by scholars at the London School of Economics shows that, in fact, it was just over 60% of people in that age group that turned out. But notice, as one goes up the age structure until one gets to the 65s and older, uh, turnout increases. Turnout for the uh, 65 and older, the old age pensioners or seniors, as you would, as you would say here, was 90%. 90%. Nobody foresaw this. I remember heated debates about how turnout would affect the result. We in the Remain camp were confident that if turnout was north of 60%, we would win. And when the turnout number came in and it was above that, we thought we were good. That night, I went to the opera. I like to go to the opera on historic nights. I went to the opera on the night that Britain crashed out of the exchange rate mechanism. Uh, and so I was at the English National Opera with, uh, with sources close to Downing Street. Uh, after the opera, we saw turnout numbers and we grew quite euphoric and began to decide on how exactly David Cameron should handle victory. <laughs> it's painful to reflect on history's contingencies. Not until results came in from the north of England, particularly Sunderland, did the ghastly, horrible reality dawn uh, that the turnout was not really the key. The key was the turnout according to age. When you add percentages who voted remain to my chart, you know all you really need to know about what happened. So the young were indeed strongly uh, in favour of remain. Uh, my older British-born uh, children uh, who voted... Uh, voted Remain, and were even more shattered than I was by the result. The problem was Granny. Because the, 
the huge turnout of the uh, older voters greatly benefited the Brexit side. Uh, that chart really is the key to understanding what happened. And although it seems likely to me uh, that Donald Trump will be defeated uh, on November the 8th, uh, for reasons that I hardly need to dwell on, do watch closely for differentials uh, in turnout by age in this election. The generational conflict that is at the heart of public finance and economic policy in all developed countries and some less developed countries is the key to 21st century politics. It's no longer about class or quintiles of income distribution. Politics is increasingly about generations. And Brexit revealed very clearly the inbuilt advantage that the elderly have uh, in modern uh, developed country democracies. There are a lot of them, and they don't have much else to do except politics if they choose to do it. I want to try to explain now why so many older British voters voted for Brexit. Uh, there are other sociological dimensions to the story that I could uh, go into. Uh, there was certainly a, a differential by socioeconomic class. Uh, the uh, lower class voters were more likely to vote for Brexit than the upper class. There was a differential by education too. Uh, but uh, I do think that age is crucial to understanding what happened, and we need to understand why they voted the way they did. It was not about the sovereignty of Parliament. That was an issue that mattered to a group of powerfully uh, influential Conservative members of Parliament. Nobody else cared. Indeed, the public's view of members of Parliament is not that much better than uh, the American public's view of members of Congress. Uh, uh, remember that House of Cards was originally a British television series and <laughs> before uh, Frank there was Francis Urquhart. Uh, no, the public didn't care about this issue that matters so much to members of Parliament like Bill Cash. Economics was supposed to be the key. It was central to the government's strategy. Indeed, it was the be-all and end-all of the government's strategy to argue that if Britain voted for Brexit, um, Hieronymus Bosch-like scenes would unfold, as Private Eye amusingly implied. Her Majesty's Treasury produced a report, this is taken from that report, which projected the impact of a vote to leave the EU on the UK over a two-year time frame in two scenarios. A shock scenario, Brexit, and a severe shock scenario, essentially hard Brexit. Britain leaves not just the EU, but the single market. Uh, neither of these scenarios was calculated to enthuse voters. Uh, GDP would shrink by between 4 and 6%. Inflation would go up, unemployment would go up, wages would go down, house prices would go down, the stock market would go down, the index of uh, sterling would go down. All of these things were predicted by the Treasury and George Osborne sought to calculate on the basis of this report how much Brexit would cost each household in the country. This backfired. Project Fear, as it was dubbed by the Brexit campaign, failed. Proving that it's not the economy, stupid. Not anymore. Uh, if it were the economy, then surely, with these projections, the Remain camp would have won. I want to emphasize that while one can quibble about uh, the numbers, the, the idea that Brexit would cause an economic shock to the UK was completely correct. How could it not? when something between uh, 50 and 55% of British trade is with the rest of the European Union, as this chart shows. But the interesting thing here is that the economic arguments didn't work. Why not? Well, one reason is that so much of the economic recovery that had happened since the financial crisis had happened in London. 
this uh, chart here, which is a Deutsche Bank chart, uh, shows jobs uh, increases. This is essentially uh, the, job, the new jobs added by region. And as you can see, whether you look at the period since 2008 or 2010, overwhelmingly, it has been in London that new jobs have been created. But London voted to remain. It was provincial England that voted to leave. And one could hazard, as Deutsche Bank's economists did, the guess that Brexit is explicable in these narrowly economic terms. If the recovery had essentially been in London and the South East, and this is a, another way of calculating it, looking at the uh, contributions to gro gross uh, value added, then maybe the Brexit vote's explicable in, te in terms of median weekly earnings, which is what you have here, average weekly median uh, wages plotted against the remain share of the vote. That's the economic determinist line, that the recovery had been so geographically concentrated that provincial England just didn't care and wasn't intimidated by project fear. Tempting though it is to subscribe to such economically uh, elegant explanations, I don't think that's right. No, it wasn't that Project Fear failed, so much as that it didn't address the central concern of the electorate. And that concern was immigration, not job creation. Now, this is a very, very important story to understand. And without it, you can't possibly get Brexit. What I've got here are data on both immigration, that's the dark line, and emigration, that's the light green line, and then the bars give you net migration, going back to the year I was born, 1964. When I was born, Britain was still a net exporter of people. My uh, mother's sister emigrated to Canada. Uh, we very nearly stayed in Kenya, where we went in 1966. And this continued to be true all the way through until the 1980s, when for the first time, immigration exceeded emigration. In our time, since the 1990s, this gap has widened. And notice, from around the mid-2000s, emigration has declined, even as immigration has continued to increase. You don't need to have a PhD in mathematics to understand what that means. That net migration has risen to unprecedented heights in modern British history in the very recent past, uh, really since the beginning of this century. Now, considering the centrality of migration to the Brexit debate, uh, it's amazing how big the difference was and is between perception and reality. To read the Daily Mail, one would think that a tidal wave of Poles and Lithuanians had arrived in the country, rapaciously taking the jobs of honest, hard-working provincial Englishmen. But this is not at all the case. In fact, if you look at what's happened, uh, a really large proportion of the immigration that we've seen in the last decade or so is actually from outside the European Union altogether. So if you exclude the small number of UK nationals who just came back, more than half of immigrants in 2014 came from outside the European Union. And of those non-EU migrants, it's very striking that a majority came from countries that had absolutely no historic connection to the UK. They weren't former colonies. 30% uh, of all immigrants in 2014 came from non-European, non-Commonwealth countries. Asylum seekers, who played a really large part in the UKIP part of the campaign, are a trivial number of people coming into the UK. In 2014, just over 25,000 people applied for asylum in the UK. But those applications have very poor prospects of, in fact, being successful. So, Students from abroad are far more numerous in these numbers uh, than, uh, than asylum seekers. And notice the numbers on migration count foreign students as if they intended to stay, which of course relatively few of them 
do in the case of the UK. The plot thickens as one drills down further into the data. So of the EU immigrants, and the numbers did increase after 2012, more than half were from the original core EU countries. Relatively fewer came from the newer East European states. And if you add up the impact on population, people from the East European countries who joined the EU only in 20, 2004 come to only around 2% of the UK population. These people are nearly all employed. And there's no question that EU workers in the United Kingdom pay their way, and then some, into public finance. If you were a reader of the Daily Mail newspaper, probably the most influential organ in the debate on Brexit, you would know none of what I have just said. You would believe the exact opposite of what I've just said. You would believe that most of the immigrants were from Eastern Europe and that they were a drain on public finances. Lies in politics have never been more powerful in modern times than in 2016. Trying to explode these fictions was very difficult. Why? Because the official campaign for Remain had opted out of this debate entirely. The decision was taken not to engage on immigration, but to engage only on the economy. I believe this was a fundamental strategic mistake which allowed lies about immigration to become truths in the minds of voters. Restricting immigration to the UK makes no sense, especially restricting it from the rest of the EU. If you just look at this second chart here, there is absolutely no evidence that the increase in the employment of people born outside the UK has affected employment of people born inside the UK. In fact, job creation has gone up in pretty much the same direction for both groups. The recovery in Britain has been very good at creating jobs, partly because productivity in Britain seems exceptionally low. But maybe that's better than having a high unemployment rate. Arguably, there would not have been a recovery without the migration that happened. If you just look at the accumulation in, uh, the accumulation in jobs growth going right back to 2010, you see just how important non-UK workers have been, especially in the recent past. Not letting these people in would have imposed a real constraint on the UK economy. You start to see that it can't be about economics. Or if it is about economics, it's about economics in Alice in Wonderland, territory through the looking glass in which everything is turned on its head. And I haven't even got to the most important point about the economics that I could make. It is impossible for Britain to restrict migration from the European Union without leaving the single market. You can't have it both ways. I don't know how many times European leaders have to say this before it will sink in to the heads of Daily Mail editors and leader writers. Wolfgang Schäuble made it explicitly clear in an interview with Der Spiegel before the referendum. It was repeated by, Wolfgang Schäuble, by Jean-Claude Juncker. Uh, it's been said again by Angela Merkel and François Hollande in recent weeks. So the economic hit to Brexit isn't just about the fact that the UK economy needs migrant workers. The real problem is that if Britain does end up outside the single market at the end of what will be the longest divorce in modern uh, political history, uh, although I suppose Brangelina might go even longer, <laughs> then the hit to the UK economy will be as large as projected by the UK Treasury. Those projections may even turn out to be underestimates if we end up with hard Brexit. But suppose I'm leading you down a cul-de-sac by emphasizing economics. Suppose we're missing something profound about Brexit. Namely that Brexit is really about culture. In a very nice new paper 
uh, by my former colleagues at Harvard. Uh, this is Engelhardt and Norris's new paper. The argument is made that populism as a worldwide phenomenon in the US as well as in Europe it's not really about those old arguments that used to dominate politics between the economic left that believed in state management, re redistribution of the welfare state, etc., and the economic right that believed in free market, small state, deregulation, low taxation. That's the old politics, 1980s vintage. The argument they make is that the new politics pits populism against cosmopolitan liberalism. Cosmopolitan liberals believe in pluralistic democracy, tolerant multiculturalism, multilateralism, progressive values, kale salad. Populism <laughs> believes in anti-establishment, strong leaders with a popular will, nationalism, traditional values, and uh, huge sodas. Uh, that cultural dimension of populism, uh, it seems to me is of enormous importance in understanding why economic arguments got nowhere, even when they were right. If you're making an economic argument and the other side is essentially making a cultural one, you are wasting your breath. Your projections don't matter. In fact, because projections are the kinds of things that people who are cosmopolitan liberals do, by definition, they have no traction. So the, the problem with the whole debate was that we weren't really on the same battleground as the pro proponents of Brexit. Let me illustrate why. Lord Ashcroft's polling in the period after the result was extremely illuminating on this point. If you dislike one of the following terms, you can see how likely you were to vote for Brexit. Multiculturalism, social liberalism, immigration, environmentalism, feminism, even the internet, <laughs> globalization, capitalism. If you had a negative view of any of those things, you were more likely, and in the case of multiculturalism, social liberalism, immigration, a lot more likely to vote for Brexit. These are the associations that I believe illuminate what happened in Britain in June. And Brexit, here we get into very familiar territory to the United States viewer, Brexit had its racial and ethnic dimension. Uh, look at the proportions of people of mixed race who are Asian, who are Muslim, who are Chinese, Hindu, black, who voted uh, for Brexit, uh, down in the 30% range. Whereas you had substantial support for Brexit amongst people identifying as Christians, interestingly as Jews, interestingly uh, white uh, voters, or when Sikh voters too were past the 50% mark. So it's not enough to say Brexit was a white phenomenon. That wouldn't be quite true. But it's certainly true to say that Brexit polarised voters along ethnic and religious lines. My favourite chart, though, is this one. Asked if they thought the result, quote, might make us a bit better off or worse off as a country, but there probably isn't much in it either way. <laughs> no fewer than 69% of people who voted Remain agreed. Some recent work by the LSE researchers I mentioned earlier showed that the losers on the Remain side were extremely emotional in their responses to the result. Uh, you may have seen some of the articles that were published about this research. There was a good deal of weeping. Uh, young people are prone to weep, not having been brought up in the school of hard knocks like me, but they, they cried a lot um, as they learned that they... Uh, were no longer going to be uh, European citizens. But that's, to me, less interesting than the fact that the people who voted for Brexit didn't really think it would make much difference. The great frivolity of this referendum seems to me to be captured in this chart. The more extremely for Brexit you were, the less you thought it mattered. Let me tell you a story. I did my homework on this, 
I travelled around provincial Britain a lot in the weeks before the vote. I was in Scotland and I could see that Scotland was going to vote to remain. Then I went to South Wales. I expected it to be the same story. After all, wasn't Labour pro-Europe? And wasn't South Wales a Labour heartland as surely as central Scotland? I was sitting in a pub, a pub called the Prince of Wales, near a town called Bridge End. And I was having a pint. And I was sitting next to the guy who owns the biggest liquor store in Bridge End. Do you know, he said to me, the most popular beers in my liquor store? I said, no, I do not know the most popular beers in your liquor store. Polish and Lithuanian beer. By far the most popular beer. Flies out the store, it does. I said, that is fascinating information. You must be very strongly in favor of Remain then, as clearly your biggest customers are migrant workers from Eastern Europe. Oh no, said he. I'm voting for Brexit. I looked at him somewhat bemused. He said, because you see, it just goes to show how much bloody money they're making off us. <laughs> it was at this moment that I realized that our economic arguments were not really cutting much ice. <laughs> this man was going to vote for Brexit despite the fact that his best customers were EU migrant workers from Eastern Europe. It's all about immigration, said one of my friends on the way home from the pub. That's what it's about. That's all anybody talks about, immigration. South Wales is a cosmopolitan kind of place by the standards of provincial Britain. Cardiff had one of the earliest mixed-race communities in the British Isles. When I realised that South Wales was voting Brexit, I realised that we had a problem. And it was after that that I revised my probabilities <coughs> upwards. I've just got time to offer a few concluding reflections and then we'll open it up for half an hour of discussion. So, the idea that Brexit doesn't really matter one way or the other, which as you just saw, nearly 70% of Brexit voters believed, turns out to be wrong. And if they were planning a Spanish vacation next year, they should revise that to a vacation in Scotland or perhaps in South Wales. The impact on sterling, which you can see here in this chart, is approaching a 20% devaluation. We're down from 160 to about 121. It may go further, it's hard to say, but that's a pretty significant devaluation by the standards of currency markets. It's one of the biggest currency moves in the world this year. Only Argentina is bigger. And you know, if you're going to have a vote like this that fundamentally scares foreign investors, I would wait until you didn't have a current account deficit of seven percentage points of GDP. That is what you can see here. The current account deficit on the eve of this vote was around 7% of gross domestic product. A post-war record. You do not need a Nobel Prize in economics, though it would be nice, to, um, to realize that this is a very dangerous moment to scare foreign investors. You really do need quite a lot of money to flow into the UK to fill a gap that large. And we still don't know the terms of this divorce. If you look at this diagram, you can see the complexity of the position. To leave the European Union is one thing, but are you leaving the European economic area? You're clearly outside the Eurozone, you're outside Schengen, but what about the customs union? The nature of this divorce is not yet clear. In that sense, Brexit hasn't happened. Britain is in the position of somebody who has filed for divorce, but doesn't yet know the terms. It's the Angelina Jolie position to be in. If anybody in this room has been through a divorce, they'll know that at this stage you probably don't have entirely realistic uh, ideas about how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost. 
It's going to cost way more than people think, and it'll probably take way longer too. Divorce is like that. And remember, in this case, you have more than one embittered former spouse to worry about. You've got 27. <laughs> These are the, the options, insofar as it's possible to compute them. Here's where we are, full EU membership, but the question is, where do we end up? In order to simplify it, let's just assume that the ability to restrict inward EU migration is politically imperative. You have to have that. So that's out, that's out, that's out. You might get it here, which is the so-called continental partnership. You might just get it here in the customs union, uh, and you can get it under a free trade agreement or WTO rules. But you cannot get it. You cannot get it inside the single market. And every time a British politician claims that you can, that person is lying. I cannot see any state of affairs under which the EU negotiators will concede the possibility that, a me that anybody could be a member of the European single market and not s sign up for free movements of people. Well, politics is a funny old game. If you look at what's happened in opinion polls, the Conservative Party is in an unassailable position since this fiasco happened. If there were to be a general election, Theresa May would almost certainly win a landslide. Labour has suffered decline, UKIP has suffered decline, and there's not an awful lot going on further down. From the vantage point of the Conservative faithful, as was clear at the Conservative Party conference last week, this has been a great success. And those who complain, like me, were denounced by the Daily Mail as the bemoaners, uh, and by Theresa May as rootless cosmopolitans, citizens of the world. I'm proud to be a citizen of the world, and a rootless cosmopolitan, and a bemoaner of the fiasco that we're witnessing. But the consequences politically, one can, I think, see as very attractive from the vantage point of Mrs. May. She now dominates British politics in a way that David Cameron never did, did and is popular with the Tory provincial faithful in a way that he never was. One last question. Will there be a domino effect? Will other European countries follow in Britain's wake? After the vote, many people jumped to the conclusion that other countries would be next, noticing that favourable views of the European Union were hardly very resounding in France or in Greece. In fact, the European Union in 2016 is less popular in these countries than it is in Britain. But I think if you're expecting a domino effect and an unravelling of the European Union in the wake of Brexit, you're in for a d disappointment. Polling since June the 24th actually shows a reverse domino effect, where other countries have increased their commitment to staying and decreased their commitment uh, to leaving, uh, according to polls in the countries that you see here. Post-Brexit votes, for example, in Denmark, just to take one case, uh, show an increase post-Brexit in the percentage of people who want to stay. And that, I think, is because continental Europeans look at what has happened in Britain and say to themselves, we'd better not go there anytime soon. <laughs> I leave you with a reflection about the lessons uh, for the United States. Uh, bad hair is a very good predictor of bad <laughs> politics. And when, when populist leaders seek to exploit for their own ends, that backlash against globalization, cosmopolitanism, that is, I think, the defining feature of pol politics in the Northern Hemisphere these days, the sceptical voter 
should be very, very suspicious indeed. Thank you very much indeed. There is now time for questions, half an hour to be precise, and I will, um, I'll take them. I don't think we have roving microphones, or do we? We do have a roving microphone. A roving mic always sounds like an Irish voter who's managed to... So if you, have a, if you wait for the roving mic, there's a gentleman right there who got his hand up pronto. Mm. No, sorry, sir, not you. I was, uh, actually, I was actually pointing just behind you. Did the man in the green T-shirt have a question? No. Um, there's somebody down here who, who's eager to ask a question, right down at the front. Here comes the microphone, sir. Hello, thank you so much for your stimulating lecture. And I've got things to say, but I have two very precise questions to ask you, if I may. You were talking about the fact that it was very difficult to take these Brexiteers seriously, intellectually speaking. I generally agree with you, but not all of them, if I may say. Whereas frivolous, as for example, Boris Johnson among them, my own friend, Lord David Owen, who wrote a book called Vote to Leave, restructuring the EU. That's one point I wanted to make. But I want to ask you a question about the role of ideology in Brexit. I mean, you very, very precise in a very enlightening, very stimulating fashion touched on the cultural underpinnings of this Brexit vote. But don't you think generally there's an ideological factor that's at play? And you refer to the role of the press, notably Daily Mail. But it's not as if Daily Mail has just started doing this for the last two or three years. But it's been 20 years, God knows how many years. Every day, Europe is the responsible agent for doing this. Europe is responsible for what's wrong in Britain. So there's a sort of Europe pounding, Europe bashing. It's been a characteristic of the British press, and it's reinforced a certain ideological view of Britain as somehow different from these lowly Europeans, these lowly Germans, these lowly French types. That's one factor. The other thing is, uh, it's important to, to remember that the founder of the, well, one of the major architects of the single market is a British conservative politician, to whom even in his own conservative party, uh, and I'm not a conservative, I'm a social democrat, but the point being, even his own conservative party members haven't paid much, much tribute, Lord Andrew Cockfield. And he, in a very interesting interview, with a French researcher, referred to the fact that it's very difficult to talk with the British about Europe because they suffer from what they call the Humpty Dumpty syndrome. They're worried about, sorry, oh, sorry. Just wanted to say, this is a Humpty Dumpty syndrome. The union is whatever they think, federation is whatever they think, immigration is whatever they think. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, two very excellent points. The, the consensus, or the coalition, let me say, that formed against the European Union was uh, made, of, made up of many odd bedfellows. Uh, and it was certainly surprising to see uh, David Owen in bed with Boris Johnson. Uh, uh, Nigel Lawson was in the same bed, and Lawson had been the one who'd advocated Britain joining uh, the exchange rate mechanism. And, and, and I could go on. I mean, the, the problem about running the Remain campaign was there were these defections of people and I include Boris Johnson in this, who, broadly speaking, are cosmopolitan in their, in their outlook, uh, who, broadly speaking, uh, uh, regard Brexit as a chance for greater openness, not less, but who, for some reason, shut their eyes to the fact that they were getting into a bed that was already being slept in by Nigel Farage, that was already being slept in by the most uh, unpleasant elements on the political right in Britain. Uh, and what did they expect to happen? Did they really think that they were getting the public to vote for a free trade Britain that would have even more open borders than the Britain before the referendum? This was a fantasy. And they ended up taking a ride on the back of a populist uh, beast that they had no way of controlling. The second point you make about the press is completely right. Uh, the direction that the populist beast went in was largely set by the Daily Mail. And the mail had been moving in that direction uh, for at least 20 years, uh, certainly since the editorship of Paul Dacre uh, began. This was a, a, a kind of shift that, ar that occurred in the Conservative Party too, away from the high Thatcherite period when she was actually in power and when the single market was indeed a British project, as you rightly say, uh, into the post-1990 Thatcher period. Uh, when she grew increasingly Eurosceptical, and the male uh, followed that lead. 
The campaign against Europe waged by the tabloid press has been relentless and it's reinforced a, a view that ultimately only through exit could Britain redeem itself. To me, it's, it's, it's profoundly tragic because the people who think that it doesn't really matter one way or the other but who voted for Brexit because they don't like immigrants will probably end up being the principal losers of the entire enterprise. Uh, and that's why populism is toxic. Um, and anybody from Latin America knows this because Latin America has run this experiment more than most parts of the world. But it's the people who vote for populist leaders who end up getting stiffed. And that's, I th I'm absolutely sure, what's going to happen in the case of, of Brexit. The people who voted for Brexit because, like, say, Daniel Hannan, they thought they could make Britain an even more open uh, Britain than it was possible to have under Europe, have already been... Uh, betrayed and are realising in the wake of Theresa May's conference speech just how badly they've been duped. Theresa May's done a superb bit of bait and switch. She was on the side of Remain, but in such a low-key way that you could count on the fingers of one hand the number of speeches she made in defence of EU membership. The speech at the conference last week was an extraordinary confection of UKIP ideas on immigration and Labour ideas on the economy. <coughs> betrayal ultimately of, of Thatcherism more or less from beginning to end. So yeah, I think you've hit on a couple of key points. Defections by people who really should have known better and ultimately the malign role of the, the Daily Mail. I keep hoping that Peter Thiel will do to the Daily Mail what he did to Gorka, um, be the obvious next target for a massive devastating lawsuit. Other questions? Um, well, I'll, I'll ask Daniel uh, to, to take the next one since... He got me here. Thank you very, very much, Neil, for a terrific uh, presentation. Uh, I fear that one of the consequences of this is that Jack is going to ask me uh, to organize our next uh, event uh, because uh, you know this sets the standards uh, to which we should aspire. Look, as I was born and raised in the United Kingdom, and uh, I'm now a U.S. citizen, and, and from that vantage, I'm struck by the sort of legal and, and constitutional. Uh, dimensions of this uh, choice. When you talk about the sort of frivolity uh, of Britain's choice for, for Brexit, little seems more uh, frivolous uh, from my vantage than the ambiguity of the sort of constitutional terms on which the referendum uh, was uh, contested. It's not obviously clear how binding the referendum is and upon whom. Indeed, the sort of constitutional uh, procedures for reviewing or reconsidering uh, the terms of the referendum are you know totally absent so so i wonder whether you know what's what's going on has to do with the degeneration of Britain's unwritten sort of informal uh, constitutional structure, a circumstance that is just not replicated in any other uh, advanced uh, democracy i think future historians will struggle to understand why the referendum ever happened? Uh, the, the answer to the question is that it seemed like the only way to win the 2015 election. And it was in that sense a piece of political, uh, tactical manoeuvring. If one talks to people like my former student Amit Gill, who was the head of strategy in number 10, the key argument was, if we don't do this, we, we're going to lose. And that, that's how it seemed when the idea was first hatched in 2013. The prospect of, a, of an election in May uh, 2015 was really quite alarming at that point. You had people defecting to UKIP from the right of the Conservative Party. Uh, and uh, you also had uh, Labour seemingly on the road back to power with, uh, with uh, Ed Miliband. So, so I think one can see the, the calculation that was made and then it worked. Because by committing to a referendum, you headed off defections to UKIP. And you put Dad Miliband in an impossible position. Was he for it? Was he against it? He couldn't decide. And it was easy to see why he couldn't decide later. Because, of course, Labour had a whole swathe of voters who were, in fact, pro-Brexit. And here it turns out, and this is, I don't think, well understood in the US, that Labour's the real key to what happened. It was the fact that Labour changed its leadership after its defeat to the Trotskyist uh, uh, infiltrator, Jeremy Corbyn, and then embarked on a kind of uh, 
laughably half-hearted campaign in, in support of Remain that made all the difference. Sunderland is not exactly a conservative safe seat. It was the North, it was Wales, it was Labour heartlands that decided the outcome. Older Labour voters voted Brexit, partly because Corbyn made no effort to dissuade them, partly because they probably would have even if he'd tried harder. So I think that's a really critical and unforeseeable element in the, in the story. Nobody at the time the referendum was devised imagined that victory in 2015, and, and victory that gave the Conservatives an absolute majority, victory would lead to the collapse of Labour and its takeover by the Trotskyists. That's an amazing thing. The day that Jeremy Corbyn was elected uh, in 2015, I, I saw George Osborne in London and I said frivolously, I wonder if there's any kind of cloud attached to this silver lining. Yeah. And he replied, oh yes, there is, because our unity will now disintegrate in the absence of a credible opposition. And he was right. His expectations about how many people would defect to Brexit from the Parliamentary Party were wildly off. As for cabinet defections, they never thought Michael Gove would jump ship. And that was really, I think, one of the least easily foreseeable uh, consequences of the Labour, the Labour collapse. But, but your question was about the, the constitutional aspect of the referendum, and I think it's a very good one. When referendums started to play a bigger part in British political life, I was a um, uh, young, I suppose a schoolboy, uh, at the time of the original referendum on EU membership, uh, which was to ratify the decision in 1975, and then again in 1979 in the referendum on Scottish devolution that was defeated. Uh, refer the referendums were drawn up very differently. There was a rule, for example, in the Scottish 1979 referendum that insisted that a certain proportion of the electorate actually vote for the decision. If that had been done, if the same rubric had been applied in uh, the, 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 the Brexit referendum, it wouldn't have carried. So what really will, I think, interest historians is the, ca is the casual way that the referendum was designed. Uh, and that was based on uh, an, uh, an, uh, an earlier and almost forgotten referendum uh, on uh, changing the electoral system, uh, which was uh, easily carried against uh, any change, and then the Scottish referendum. Cameron, having won in Scotland, thought he could win again by the same methods. Project Fear had worked in Scotland in 2014. The Scots voters, by the eve of that referendum, had been persuaded to a substantial extent that, that independence would cost them. So that a, a majority of Scottish voters on the eve of the vote accepted that if they voted for independence, it would cost them. That did not happen in England in 2016. And it was when the polls showed that a really only a quite small minority of English voters thought it would make an economically negative impact, when those polls came in that I really started to get worried. Um, as to the constitutional aftermath, it's surreal. This was partly supposed to be about parliamentary sovereignty. Then we were told that Parliament wouldn't have any say in the terms uh, of the Brexit settlement. Then they had to do a U-turn when they discovered that they, well, they'd kind of forgotten this, that with their tiny majority, which they only still have, they, they couldn't really ignore uh, this rather ingenious move by the new star of the Labour front bed bench, Keir Starmer. It's a fiasco. Referendums are a bad idea. If anybody proposes having one here, you, you should oppose it. I gather this has been occasionally suggested in California, but <laughs> don't go there, I'm telling you. It's, what, you already do this? The referendum in, in Europe today has the quality of a game of Russian roulette with a two-chamber gun. Because and Mr. Renzi in Italy is about to play this game in December. Uh, so I, I, I think that the real lesson is don't do referendums, unless you're Swiss, and even then. The man in the green t-shirt now does have a question, and he has the microphone. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your talk, Professor Ferguson. Um, I was wondering whether you foresee Scottish independence being a likely outcome of the Brexit vote. Well, Nicola Sturgeon has just announced that there will be consultation about another referendum uh, to thunderous applause at the SNP 
uh, party conference. So it's game on. Um, and at, at this point in time, referendum fatigue and the polls that we have don't give her much encouragement to think she can win. But if I'm right, if the Treasury is right about the costs of the divorce, and if this turns out to be the big mess I think it will be, then Nicola Sturgeon might pull it off. It's all going to be about timing. It's all going to be about how big a mess the situation uh, looks like. But I certainly don't rule it out. And I'm very, I feel very ambivalent about this, to be honest. Um, having campaigned to keep Scotland in the UK and the UK in Europe, if the English turn around, provincial England turns around and says, I feel more English than British, and I don't feel European at all, it's suddenly a much less pleasant United Kingdom to be a part of. And I certainly must confess to having felt a strong surge of Scottish nationalism <laughs> after my initial disappointment at the Brexit result. And I had to kind of calm myself down. <laughs> think about this. Think about this. Don't go on TV. Don't go... <laughs> don't do... Um, and I, I, I still feel as if the breakup of the United Kingdom would be a worse thing than Britain's exit from the EU. Because then nobody would be there to control the English. Uh, <laughs> and that, that's, that's a scary thought. So, um, so if it comes up again, I'll oppose it again, no matter how big a mess Brexit is. Because in the end, I think the more important referendum was the one in 2014. You know, the EU is a thing of relatively recent invention, and it has much wrong with it. In fact, I spent much more of my career criticising the EU than praising it. it. It was awkward to have to defend it, uh, as I had to this year. But I ultimately felt that it was worth defending because the consequence of Brexit would be so negative. But I do feel more strongly about maintaining a union that dates back to 1603. Um, and I think for that to go would signal a real unravelling of, of Western civilization, which Scotland, after all, invented. <laughs> Let me take some other questions. I wonder if there are any Americans with questions, because it's... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm British too. Oh, no. <laughs> right, put your hands down if you're British. You're going to be deported anyway. Um, <laughs> sent back to England where you belong. Um, let me try and find an, Amer um, an American question there. Well, I just have a very narrow question about one number you showed that puzzled me. Mm. Uh, and it was the one on your chart that showed the breakdown of pro-Brexit votes of Christians, Jews, Sikhs. Yeah. And then you had Hindus that are very low. Uh, now, I'm totally ignorant of the religious and ethnic distinctions in India, and so maybe this is a nonsense question, but I just found that puzzling. Yeah. There was such a gap between Hindus and Sikhs residing in Britain that voted. Yeah. Is there some reason for that that's interesting, or is this to totally not interesting? It's very interesting and surprising that these differentials emerged. I think I had assumed that there would be a straightforward white-non-white -white split, and it was, it was surprising to me to find that the... The, uh, the, the Sikh Hindu difference was so striking. And I, I, I don't know whether one can explain this uh, as a kind of uh, a response to the increasingly organized Muslim community in Britain, but that might be it. And I, I think that if, if one looks at London politics particularly, you see how very well organized uh, the Muslim communities have become in London, how very important they've become in the Labour Party. Uh, Sadiq Khan is a product of this world, the new mayor of London. And my sense is that one possible explanation for the differential, uh, differentiation between Muslim and, and Hindu and Sikh voters lies there. But that is a conjecture. I cannot back that up with data. Relatively little, if anything, that I have seen has been written about this. But, but it's a very interesting point. Further questions. There's a lady with a blue shirt there, um, right sort of in the... Hard, yes, you, madam, are very hard to reach by a roving mic, but <laughs> I'm eager to have a female question at this stage. Uh, thank you for a great le lecture. Um, I've got two questions. One, is it possible to cancel the divorce proceedings? And two, 
when you looked at the elderly, which I'm one of, and you said it was that they have time, I think a lot of it is about history and that um, when people got the vote, it was very difficult to get the vote for women and for African Americans. So they appreciate the fact of going to vote. And I'm from Australia, and in Australia, we are forced to vote, Com you know, compulsory voting. They're the two questions. Just is it a possibility that it's the history of the elderly that are aware of the difficulty people have gone through to get a vote? Yeah, I think these are two very good questions. Can this divorce be called off? Or will they have one of those strange Hollywood remarriages that, that <laughs> people go in for? Um, this is the Elizabeth Taylor option. I find it hard to imagine because I think that the Theresa May's government is now committed to Brexit to the extent that her political reputation cannot survive the divorce not happening. Precisely because she was on the wrong side, but has been the winner of the House of Cards sequence of events that you all doubtless enjoyed, you know, the, the stabbings of in the back, un, un, unlike anything I've seen since Oxford student politics. And that's not surprising because they all were Oxford student politicians. <laughs> I mean, this was deja vu for me. I couldn't believe it. So wait a second. So, so Michael stabs Boris and then Theresa stabs Boris or Boris stabs himself. I mean, it's, <laughs> you, this was 1980s Oxford come back to life. But the net result is that Theresa May... Uh, emerges triumphant, but she has to be more Brexit than the Brexiteers, precisely because she needs everybody to forget that she was on the losing side. Uh, so I don't think it gets called off on the British side. I think the European position is hardening. Look, divorce is like this. Um, the possibility of reconciliation uh, dwindles very rapidly as the process advances. Uh, positions become more polarised uh, in a regular divorce uh, and in this kind of divorce too. Uh, you had Donald Tusk only today, and he's supposed to be relatively conciliatory, taking the no single market access if you limit free movement of people. That position equals hard Brexit. On the, on the other side, it's a kind of uh, game of chicken between those people who are committed to a hard Brexit and those who have got very cold feet about it. Uh, but I don't see a way in which this suddenly all goes away. On the contrary, I think we're now on a kind of inexorable path to divorce. The only question is how long it will take and how much it will cost. Uh, it's the biggest divorce since Henry VIII in terms of British uh, history. Your second question about uh, differentials in, in, in turnout and, and, the, and the role of history is a really interesting one. It's certainly... The whole experience has made me more sympathetic to the peculiar Australian institution of compulsory voting. If we had compulsory voting in Britain, the result might well have been different because you would have forced all those young people who didn't show up uh, to vote and that might just have been enough. It almost certainly would have been enough. If everybody had voted at the rates the 65s and, and older did, then I think Brexit would have been defeated. If we had compulsory voting in the United States, then Hillary Clinton wouldn't need to lose any sleep because she knows that people with a low turnout history, uh, the young African Americans, um, are going to show up for her uh, if they show up. So if they're forced to show up, she's home and dry, without a doubt. And yet, some part of me rebels against the thought of compulsory participation because it seems to me that ultimately our participation in a free society should be voluntary, should be of our own volition, and that citizens should not be forced at, on pain of p penalty to vote. Uh, so I'm kind of not quite there. I will say one thing, though, and it struck me very forcibly on my last visit to Sydney, where I was uh, shortly before the referendum. We talk about the hollowing out of the middle class a lot in this country. In fact, it's a recurrent leitmotif of debate. When you get to Australia, you find that the middle class has not been hollowed out. In fact, it seems to be almost a universal class to which everyone belongs. Uh, Sydney feels different from American cities in that respect. 
Uh, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, compulsory voting is part of the reason why that hollowing out has not been so far advanced. So my mind on this at this point is in a state of, of self-confessed flux. As somebody who keeps moving westward, uh, I've, I've, been, I've been already tipped for a job in Western Australia by the time of my 60th birthday. So, um, Let me take a question from that corner over there. There's a gentleman who just raised his hand. Thank you, and thank you again for a very good talk. Um, I'm sorry to say, yes, another British person uh, with the uh, reserve of a dual Irish passport should things come to pass. But my question really is, um, the former director of the British Museum, who's recently moved to Germany, did a very good exhibition and a book on Germany and German culture, which you're probably well aware of. And he gave a talk at the opening of this exhibition in Germany recently. And he said, if I paraphrased him correctly, that um, in Britain, we tend to look on history as a celebration of our victories. And one of the very um, warming things that he found about German culture was that uh, the uh, honesty about their history and their past was much stronger and much better. So coming back to your cultural question, do you think that our history has failed us in the way we tell it? This is a very good question, perhaps a good one on which to conclude our discussion as the clock uh, ticks towards half past. There's a crisis in history, and it, it takes two distinct forms on both sides of the Atlantic. On the one side, there is the failure of uh, mainstream history departments in universities to connect with the wider public in any meaningful way. And the increasing antiquarianism uh, of the historical profession seems to me to be a real problem. The more that has advanced, the more history in the sense of books that people buy has been left in the hands of public intellectuals of varying degrees of, of competence. Uh, we don't have anything in Britain quite as bad as uh, O'Reilly's <laughs> Killing Trump series. Um, I dare say that volume is in the pipeline for release next year. Uh, but, but we do certainly have a, a, a plethora of authors whose uh, great preoccupation is, is the world wars and the endless retelling of, uh, of World War II as a national triumph is something that Germans frequently complain about. And I haven't yet read Neil McGregor's lecture, but I, I get the point he's, he's making. Though it doesn't seem reasonable to me to, to, to tell uh, British newspaper readers that they should somehow replicate the German experience of, uh, of re-education when they didn't have a Nazi regime and didn't lose World War II. That, that, would be, that would be to ask too much. But what's odd about World War II is that remarkably few people now living fought in it. Uh, and when we talk about the 65s and, and over, we're not really talking about people that old. I mean, you said you were uh, an older voter. You don't look like it, and I hope I don't too much. Uh, but, but the truth is that the people aged 65 and older are not veterans of World War II with glorious memories uh, of uh, VE Day. Those people are mostly dead. The, the people old, older than 65 were hippies in the 1970s. Uh, they're baby boomers. Uh, and uh, they're the ones who seem to me to be uh, most at fault for... Uh, adhering to a romanticised notion of British history to which they contributed precisely nothing. And when Britain uh, joined the European community, as it then was in 1973, it was after a period of protracted post-war stagnation, uh, indeed stagflation, and indeed our membership of the European Union's coincided with a remarkable recovery. And guess who benefited from that recovery? Yes, those people who voted for Brexit, the ungrateful baby boomers who rode the post-1973 recovery of the UK all the way and collected all the way. And as a very good article in this week's Spectator shows, they continue to collect 
because of the ways in which British pensions have constantly been uprated by governments eager to buy the votes of the ageing baby boomers. If that sounds familiar to an American audience, it should, because that's the kind of generational politics playing out in the United States today. Congratulations, sir, on your dual passport. That could come in very handy as Brexit wends its inexorable way through the divorce courts. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.